is, is that, can you see the bee? He, just, he was just reading the, the auto cue. Oh my God, he's really keen. Welcome to Almost Breaking News, uh, coming to you today from the Garden Studio. Coming up, Faraday Future, the next big thing, or the next Nikola Motor. The Tesla semi-truck is appearing out of the mists of hype. The Polestar 6 is going into production. Stellantis have been a bit naughty with their dirty diesel emissions. Wind turbines are now nine times cheaper than burning gas. A really deep geothermal borehole and solar panels can be recycled, you muppet. If you're watching this in North America, Fully Charged Live, powered by Electrify America, is in California this weekend. That is Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th of September at the San Diego Convention Center from 10 a.m. Tickets are available via fullycharged.live or on the door if you don't mind waiting in line a bit. And oh my God, I've just seen the lineup. It's fantastic and pretty impressive considering there's a serious shortage of electric vehicles and just about everything else too. We will have more electric vehicles than you've ever seen in one place. From boards to bikes, from cars to trucks, lots of visitor attractions, including the increasingly important Home Energy Advice Team. And of course, the centerpiece, 40 live sessions with Jack, Helen, Ricky, Dan, yours truly, and a host of other well-known faces, including Chelsea Sexton, Ben Sullins, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Answers with Joe, Roger Atkins, and hopefully a special appearance alongside San Diego's own Aptera from the man, the myth, the legend, Sandy Monroe. And if that wasn't enough, we'll be in Vancouver on September the 15th to start the 12-month countdown to Fully Charged Live Canada, powered by BC Hydro. So if you're a potential speaker, sponsor or exhibitor, take a look at the link to our event briefing in the show notes below this episode. And now, back to the news. Let's dive straight in and find out more about what Faraday Future are up to. There's so much hype over so many years, our very own Jack Scarlett has been taking a deep dive into the story. Over to you, Jack. Thanks, Bob. That's right. This week, I've been delving into Faraday Futures to try and make some sense of this mysterious mark. Are these guys for realsies, or are we staring down the barrel of another Nikola Motors? Now, it's been five long years since Faraday Future first unveiled its debut model, the FF91, a whopping tri-motor, 1,050 brake horsepower, $300,000 electric SUV. Yeah, I know. And yet, five years on, production is still yet to begin. Now, that is a long time, but there isn't anything especially unusual about that. It took Lucid four years to turn the air from concept to reality due to a string of unforeseen setbacks. Launching a new car, let alone a new car brand, is, as it turns out, bloody hard. And Faraday Future has had more than its fair share of setbacks. They've lost CFOs, CTOs, and CEOs. They announced grandiose plans to build a billion dollar factory in Vegas, then canned that and bought a disused Pirelli factory in California. And then there were rumors that they were gonna delegate production to Geely in China. It's all been a bit all over the place. On top of that, there have also been a handful of eyebrow raising miscommunications, the worst of which came in May of this year when it came to light that the number of FF91 reservations stood not at 14,000, as previously stated by Faraday, but at 401. That's 401 entirely refundable, non-binding pre-orders. But in spite of all of this chaos, it really seemed like things were starting to come together for Faraday Future in recent months, with the CEO stating that they had built production intent cars, that they were ready to begin building and delivering customer cars later this year. But it now seems there's a caveat. Faraday has since stated that it's going to need another round of fundraising to the tune of two to $300 million in order to be able to commence production. And this was swiftly followed by the news that a collection of Faraday employees had penned a letter to the company's board and shareholders requesting the removal of chairperson Susan Swenson on the grounds that she was involved in organized and deliberate attempts to, quote, 
push the company into bankruptcy. So is Faraday Future legit? Is this car ever going to happen? Well, it's not looking good. I have no doubt that there are countless passionate, hardworking individuals inside this company who really truly want to make this car and this brand a success. But evidently, a combination of poor leadership, poor PR, poor financial management and other unforeseen circumstances such as COVID and the microchip shortage have all chipped away at Faraday's chances of success. Now, maybe a new CEO comes in and finishes the job. Maybe an investor comes in and throws them the two to 300 million that they're gonna to need to start production, and Faraday do manage to squeeze out a few units of the FF91. But frankly, given the apparent lack of interest in the product, and given how tainted the Faraday future name now is, I fear that this is a car that will always remain in the future. Hey, you see what I did there, you see? But no, they are in serious financial trouble. I hope I'm wrong because we love to see new electric car brands thrive here at the Fully Charged Show. But personally, I won't be placing an order for an FF91 anytime soon. And not just because I don't have 300 grand. Back to you, Bob. Thanks so much, Jack. That is very interesting. I may have to dig out my Faraday Pass t-shirt again. And if you don't understand that reference, you've got to go way back and find a news episode where we discussed 1970s progressive rock bands. You know, it's, it was funny at the time. You had to be there. Next story. Okay, so Tesla announced the semi-truck, as I say, semi-truck. I can't say semi-truck, it feels weird. But they announced that back in 2017. That is a full five years ago. And after a while, we all thought it was yet another one of those, this could be the future of trucking bits of hollow waffle. Okay, clearly Tesla had a lot more chance of actually making a truck that could be like driven, let's say, up a hill, as opposed to the Nikola truck, which could roll down a hill really, really well. Uh, but it's hard not to be a bit cynical about it. To make rumours a little more concrete, Tesla have started installing mega chargers at certain locations. They already have some at their first gigafactory in Nevada, and now there are four new ones being installed in Modesto, California. Apparently, the first of 100 Class 8 trucks will be delivered to the food and beverage corporation PepsiCo in early 2023. And I had to check, a Class 8 truck is a really, really big truck. It's as big as they get. It's an 18-wheeler semi, or as we would describe in oldie England, an awfully large articulated lorry. The trailers on these beasts can be as long as 17 metres. Big, chunky trucks that can haul many tonnes of food and beverage products for hundreds of miles and then charge at high speed with hugely powerful mega charges. I'm talking 1.6 megawatts flowing through the charge cable, capable of adding 400 miles range in 30 minutes. This is crazy stuff. I cannot count the number of times I've been told with such confidence, oh well, the battery electric just won't work with big trucks. It's never gonna happen. They might be right, but this is certainly a bit of a challenge to that notion. This time, it actually looks like it might actually start to happen. Next story. Polestar 6, or as it was once known, the Polestar Roadster. Ooh, look at that. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, ooh. Oh, sir, that suits you. A proper production two-seater sports car with a soft top. Hello, you naughty boy. No, I don't want one. There is nothing sadder than an old balding man in an expensive sports car, is there? I mean, let's face it. Which is odd because about 90% of the people who can afford to own open top sports cars are old balding men or men my age with toupees and really, really strong tape. But that aside, this is clearly going to be a bit of a stunner. The Swedish electric performance car brand confirmed plans to put the Polestar electric roadster concept into production with an official launch in 2026. OK, so we've got a bit of a wait. Well, maybe in that time, I could get a bit of an Elton John, you know, or an Elon Musk, where suddenly my hair grows back really luxuriant and thick by the time this car is launched. And anyway, it's very exciting, though. Next story. Oh, yes, Stellantis. OK, a bit of a negative story here. Stellantis USA. Just been a bit cheaty with the old diesel emissions. I mean, come on, Stellantis USA. You know, it doesn't go down well with the various authorities. You know those naughty chaps at VW? Did you notice that story a few years ago? They got in a spot of bother with their not very clean diesel. You'd think people would learn, but no, no. 
What did they say? Let's keep making diesel engines and just lie about how clean they are. People will still buy them. Stellantis, in case you don't know, used to be Fiat Chrysler, so a European and American sort of conglomerate. Big boys car company making billions of dollars each year, and they carried on making cheaty, stinky diesels, even after all the hoo-ha about VW and Dieselgate. You've got to hand it to them. They got balls, to use a rather unsavoury turn of phrase. They are going to have to pay $300 million in penalties for cheating on government emissions testing on clean eco-diesel Jeep Grand Cherokee SUVs and Ram 1500 pickup trucks. They didn't even try and deny it. They, they pleaded guilty. They will pay the fine and probably still keep making eco-diesels. The snide dismissal embodied in that term, eco-diesel, really, that is low. It's like saying, this is a gentle gun. The words eco or clean and the words diesel do not now and never will go together. Here's a bit of a headline which contrasts rather starkly with the dirty diesel story. And you may find this statement shocking if you've been repeatedly told that wind turbines don't work or that they're really, really expensive. Basically, this report reveals that wind energy is now nine times cheaper than filthy imported gas from Russia, Saudi Arabia, Australia or Norway. And I list those countries as that is where a huge amount of our money is going to every day to pay for this stuff. The insane increases in the cost of fossil gas. Huge offshore wind projects are being installed in the next three to four years and they can profitably generate electricity at £48 per megawatt hour. What does that mean? Well, it's if you compare it to what uh, the eye-watering £446 per megawatt hour that is the current wholesale price of electricity generated by burning imported gas. That's quite a big difference. There are numerous influential people now in the energy space that are suggesting systems that could split wind and solar out from the general generating mix. The idea being that as an end user, of the electricity, you could choose very, very cheap renewable electricity or stupidly expensive imported gas-generated electricity. I wonder which one I would choose. The reason we're all being ripped off so brutally at the moment, uh, especially in the UK, is entirely 100% because of gas. It's not the green levies. Those are a tiny proportion of the total. It's gas. There's no getting around it. We need to stop burning gas. Fracking won't help. One, it takes years to develop. Two, our geology isn't like the USA. We'd get sod all and it would run out very fast. Three, the gas extracted will be sold on the global market because the price is so inflated. So four, it won't make any difference to the price of gas. So if you hear a beanpole posh pillock politician who wears 18th century clothes say, we need to start fracking, he's an idiot, a liar, or he has shares in a filthy fracking company. Wind and solar are cheaper. End of discussion. Shut up. Next story. Thank you. And this one is deeply boring. I mean, seriously deeply boring. We've covered geothermal energy before. We visited the five kilometre deep borehole at the Eden Project in Cornwall last year. We'll put links to that in the show notes because it was a really interesting episode. They are drilling, they're down in Cornwall, they're drilling 4.5 kilometres or about three miles beneath the surface where there is a constant temperature of between 140 and 180 degrees centigrade all year round. And that heat can be used to generate electricity or heat buildings or both, in fact. Obviously, you have to build a power station wherever the borehole is, which is expensive you've got to build the grid connection, all that. But we know that geothermal works and there are hundreds of examples of geothermal energy systems around the world, particularly where the Earth's crust is thinner, Iceland being a good example. But what if you didn't need to build a new expensive power station with all the peripheral grid connections, etc.? What if you could drill a very deep hole right next to an existing gas-fired power plant? Well, there's a company called Quays Energy who are suggesting just this. But they're not suggesting a borehole of four or five kilometres deep. They're talking of drilling down 20 kilometres or 12 and a half miles where the temperature is around 500 degrees centigrade. They will bore these super deep holes right next to existing infrastructure. And instead of burning gas to create steam and spin a turbine, they just use the heat from deep within the earth to generate the power. Or indeed, as backup baseload with short startup and shutdown times that nuclear cannot possibly match. So the big question is, how the hell do you drill 12 miles down through rock? Well, they are claiming to be developing entirely new drilling techniques. 
a thing called a gyrotron-powered drilling platform literally vaporizes boreholes through rock, and it creates so much heat that the walls of the borehole turn to glass, therefore sealing it. Gyrotron drilling that vaporizes rock? What the what? Vaporizing rock and sealing the borehole by melting actual rock into glass? What the what? So, I know from visiting the drilling rig in Cornwall that drilling down 4.5 kilometres is no mean feat. Basically, you are twisting a very long tube that in turn spins the drill bit, which is massive and seriously expensive. Four kilometres down is insane. So, I suspect using conventional drilling, uh, used in oil and gas extraction and fracking, has a maximum depth. They can't go any deeper because basically the tube would just snap or something would go wrong. I'm guessing that. I'd love a, a drilling expert to tell me, but that sounds like the reason they're developing this new technology. So after, say, four or five kilometres of conventional dri drilling, you send down the James Bond villain gyrotron drill bit and you melt your way to the Earth's core. OK, the Earth's core is thousands of miles down and it's thousands of degrees centigrade and it's white hot molten rock. So it's only 12 miles down. So, you know, but as I said, at that depth, it is seriously toasty. I really want this to work, but I'm holding back as we all should. Quay's Energy plan to have their first geothermal multi-megawatt power plant working by 2026. I'm also get, hoping to get someone from the company on the Fully Charged Show podcast soon, so we will learn more and keep you updated. And finally, solar panels. I've got a load of them. They are being installed at record rates around the world. They last 20 to 25 years minimum, and they are generating electricity with close to zero maintenance and ever-increasing efficiency. But what do you do with them in 25 years' time? If you believe the same people who tell us fracking is a sensible option, they will also tell us that we will literally throw away old solar panels into pits, always near nursery schools, or we can use them to poison puppies with the waste. Or, as we now know is the case with batteries, we recycle them and use the materials again. In the past, this hasn't been economically viable, but over the next five to ten years, many millions of solar panels will start approaching end of life, and there is enormous interest in reclaiming the very valuable materials that glass panels are coated with and reusing them in new panels and other electronics. Recyclable materials from PV panels at the end of their lifespan will be worth more than $2.7 billion in 2030, up from only $170 million this year. This trend is going to accelerate in the coming decades, with the value of recyclable materials projected to approach $80 billion a year by 2050. That is a fairly chunky lump of cash, and once again the economics change the picture from disposal to reuse. So when people ask how will we dispose of all these fancy batteries and solar panels, they are just spouting fossil lobbyist lies. We won't dispose of them, we will mash them up and reuse the materials. So that's it. Before I go, I'm going to just do a quick thanks to a handful of our super generous Patreon supporters, and they are Dean Carpenter, Roger Johansson, David Nichols, Jacob Olen, Jasper van der Vlis, Mark Hutchinson, Bingo Flangeworthy, Marco Booth, Dave Brown, Hugh O'Neill, Robert Van Maren, Neil Needham, Scott Drew, Richard Waller, Nick Allen, Bradley A. Steck, Miguel Grolet, Michael Criffin, Andrew Zamaski, and Alan Reed. Huge thanks to you. Thank you so much for supporting Fully Charged all these years. It's been enormously critically important to our survival we're really really grateful uh that's it I'm not going to say any more uh, subscribe like do all that stuff and as always if you have been thank you for watching